You know, I've had this one in my own personal uh, devotional time. There's this one word that just keeps resounding in my spirit. And I just want to stay on it for a few weeks. And it's a simple word. It's a word that we use a lot in our own, our own vocabulary. But I want to bring it into context of how the Bible uses it and how it affects and relates to us. And that word is the word good. Say good. good. Boy, we use that a lot, don't we? Say, how was dinner? Oh, it was good. You tell your kids, I'm leaving you here, but make sure you're good. We, we use that a lot in that phrasing, in that ideology, and we're going to be talking about today the context of, of you being good. There's some benefits. There's importance. It's just not a matter of you trying to be good or, or trying to do good or trying to appear good, but there's an essence below the surface, and that's where we want to get to the root of it, because if you deal with the root of something, you can deal with the fruit of something. If I can deal with the root of something, I can deal with the fruit of something. Most people try to decorate what already exists. And they don't try to change and get the right fruit. They just want it to appear like they got the right fruit. That's why we talk around here about it's a relationship, not a religion. Don't get mad at me. I'm not into religion. I define religion as man's rules to get to God. And they try. And when you get men into it, or people, I should say, into it, humanity has a way of twisting things. And it becomes all about the outside appearance by those around you. But the Bible says God looks to the heart. And if we can get the stuff in our heart right, the other stuff will work out right. Can I get an amen? One, one thing I like to say is one of the huge benefits of not lying is you never have to remember anything. Think about it. When we, have a, when we have a certain way that we act this way with a certain group of people and this way with other group of people, and you have to look different ways to make sure before you start a conversation, and you got to remember what you told, you're adding too much stress to your life. It feels so good not to have to remember what you told somebody the last time because you just tell them the truth. But there are some key elements into being good. I'll give you two references. One is if you don't know who you are in your identity, the essence of who God made you, it affects your destiny of where God wants you to go. I can prove that out. And anything I say, do not take it for granted. Challenge everything. That's a culture we've developed around here. Challenge everything I say with the Word of God. Yeah. Don't take anybody's word about anything. If they're on TV, your best friend, it don't matter. Challenge everything with the Bible because only the Bible is the foundation to which we stand and build our lives. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Thank you for the three of you. I'm going to be talking just right over to, just to you. But Jesus, if you remember the story, Jesus, when he was being tempted by the devil, he was in the wilderness for 40 days fasting and praying, and the devil would tempt him. And every temptation, every temptation started with, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, do this. If you are the Son of God, do that. The question, the importance wasn't turning a stone into bread so he can eat because the devil wasn't caring, cared about his appetite. The, the devil wasn't caring if, if the fulfillment of angels protected him from the, the cliff. The devil was trying to challenge him at his point of identity. Yeah. If you are the son of God. If you are the son of God. Several things happen to us in our own walk with God because the devil will, try, will challenge you. Do you think you're good enough? Do you really think God's going to answer that? It, do you th really think God could use you? Do you really think God will help you? And the devil will challenge your identity. And a couple things that he'll do is first he'll try to give you a little pushback just to see if you believe who you are based on what the Bible says. If Jesus would have crumbled, it would affect destiny. If he would have crumbled, it would affect ministry. If he would have crumbled, it would affect all of us. Because we're here because of Jesus. Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. If you are the son of God. And one of the things that happens to us in those tension moments is the devil's trying to not get us to, to do something just to do it. He's trying to get Jesus to make that stone into bread because at that moment, if Jesus would say, I am, let me prove it, he would get Jesus to do stuff or to, let me get us to do stuff to prove who we are. Right. Stay with me. If you have to do something to prove who you are, 
then you're not. If you have to jump through hoops to validate your identity, you really are not secure in your identity. If you're, have you ever, if you're a Christian, then you would help me. That's a tactic of the devil. I'm not saying that you shouldn't help people. But you shouldn't be under the devil's control to help people to validate your identity. If I have to do what you say to validate my identity, I really don't know who I am. It, and so well, we talked before, it doesn't mean we don't do good, but we don't do good to validate our, who we are. We do good because we know who we are. That'll, that'll free you so much from what even good people sometimes do this, manipulate or try to pressure us to do something that they really want to happen. Have you ever wanted something to happen so badly that you're willing to cross that line to even maybe coerce or manipulate or pressure people to do it? We've all been there. And it, it takes maturity to say, nope, even though I want it, I'm not going to cross that boundary to pressure people to do something. Because other people, you can get pressured by people in a lot of areas. And if you start jumping through those hoops of, oh, if I don't do what sister so-and-so or Mr. So-and-so or apostle so-and-so or bishop so-and-so or pastor so-and-so tell me to do, then they're going to tell me that things are, that I, I, I won't make it. Well, they're not your Jesus in the first place. Hear me out, hear me out. There is a balance. I'm not saying that you're disrespectful to spiritual authority that God places in your life. I'm not saying be re- disrespectful to authority that God places in your life. But I'm saying there's a balance. Yeah. And when even a good authority starts getting out of balance, there's a right way to handle it. And God doesn't want you to be manipulated, controlled by other people. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, there's three or four. We're getting closer. We're warming up. <laughs> Someone looked at their friend and said, don't you dare say that. <laughs> no, God wants us to understand our identity. Because when you start jumping through hoops to validate your identity, then you really don't know who you are. Right. Jesus didn't say, well, I could take and make that stone into bread. Let me show you what I can do. Nope. He just kept speaking the word. Yep. He kept speaking the word. Yep. Because the question, the challenge was identity. If you don't know who you are in God, if you don't know that you are good in God, do you know what happens when you go to do something? Maybe it's your believing for a better job. Maybe it's your believing for a, a better pay. Maybe it's you're believing for a miracle. Maybe you're believing to, uh, for a different car you're looking to buy, and you got a great deal, and you go to get it, and something on the inside says, who do you think you are? Do you really think you deserve that? You go to do a job, go to do a ministry, and somebody who loves you, and sometimes it's people who love you that are in your inner circle, that know you, don't feel bad. Because even in Jesus' inner, inner circle, he went to his own hometown and couldn't do any mighty works because of their unbelief, because they saw him as a carpenter's son and not the son of God. Sometimes when people know us so well in the flesh, they can't always perceive who we are by God. And you'll go to just, oh, I'm going to teach a Bible study. I'm going to, I'm going to lead this group. Oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go on a mission field. And someone might look at you and say, really? You're a mess. You need to stay home and clean up your own stuff before you try to help somebody else with their stuff. Because the devil has a way of trying to disqualify us in who God made us. The devil has a tendency trying to disqualify us and who God made us. And it's important to know who we are because you will hinder, stop your own ability to grow in the things of God. Proverbs 4 says that the path of the righteous, the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter and brighter. God wants us to keep growing. But in that process of growth, you'll deal with tension. You'll deal with the enemy trying to oppose you. But you know, one of the biggest things that challenge that most people never deal with is not the enemy around them. It's the enemy within them. I'm not talking about a devil or demon, and if that's the case, that can be obviously dealt with. But a lot of times, it's our perception of what we should be allowed to live. I was talking to a person recently, and they were talking about clothes in a store, and they were like, oh, I could never go to that store and buy those clothes. That's just way too expensive. And I just, you know, you ever get to a point you just want to tell the truth in love? 
And I said, well, wait a minute. And it wasn't an expensive clothing store. I said, wait a minute. I said, I got a friend who had that situation, and they, they felt like the Lord led them to this suit store. I'm not really into suits, but they were, and they went to this suit store, and this is when they were young. They had hardly any money in their account, but they just felt like they needed, just felt impressed to go in there for some reason, and they're arguing with themselves. When you're arguing with yourselves, it's not always a good sign, but you just can't. So they're, they're like, I can't afford anything in here, and they're walking around, and they, they just felt still the Holy Spirit moving upon their heart. Find a suit your size, and they're like, Lord, I can't afford anything in this store and they found one their size the only one their size and it was like twelve hundred dollars they're like i can't afford this all they had was like a hundred and fifty dollars to their name i felt like the lord impressed them go take it to the register it's like oh i'm gonna look stupid but all right i'll just try it now don't go out and do this and say that i told you to do this all right just fyi if Jesus tells you to do it, do it. If Jesus don't tell you to do it, don't do it. Jesus told Peter to walk on water, and he walked. If Jesus don't tell you to get out of the boat, stay in the boat. You see the balance? See the balance? So don't miss the point, because you're going to think, oh, I wonder what store I can go to after church. Don't be, and if you do, if you do that, don't tell them that I told you to do it, and take your tag by God wristband and push it up so they can't see it. And, So he took this expensive suit to the to register, laid it down, and he, he started to, you know, you get that moment of, oh, you know, that's that moment of when you hand your debit card to the person across, and they swipe it, and it takes three seconds longer. Have you ever been there? And you're like, and did someone spend money on my account? Have I been hacked? Did I, what's going on? And they're like looking at the machine, and you're, your heart's going, boom, 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 boom. And they let you off the hook and say, oh, this thing's been slow all day, and you're like, <laughs> about to pass out. Y'all been there. And so he set it on the counter, and he's waiting for it to, to come up with the amount. And he just knew he's going to have to say, keep, just keep it. I can't afford that. And it rang up like $112. And she said, oh, that can't be right. And she did it again. It rang up $112. She says, wait a minute. We can't sell this. It's an expensive suit. We can't sell that for $112. We got the manager and said, we got a problem here. This suit is ringing up for $112. And he scanned it. and He goes, well, if it rings up for $112, you have to sell it for 112. What am I saying? So many times, not everybody, not every time, but many times in our Christian walk, God's leading us into a path, and we disqualify ourselves for what God has because we've already preconceived in our mind that we don't deserve that. We can't handle that. We can't afford. Hey, you don't know what God has in store. Let me give you a scripture to that because we just don't want to throw ideas out. In, in Malachi 3.10, you've all heard this. Bring the tithes and offerings. Prove me now here with, say, the Lord will not open up the windows of heaven or pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. There's a context. There's always a condition to every promise. We always emphasize the, the benefits of the promise, but we also got to make sure we do the conditions. Bring the tithes and offerings at the storehouse and prove me now here with, say, the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. Uh, in the original Hebrew, in the, in the context of the Hebrew, that phrase of not ability to receive it literally means until you say enough. Come on. Come on. Until you say, okay, God, that's enough. And some of us would think, I would never tell God that's enough, but sometimes many of us do because we stop obeying or stop believing because something on the inside of what we've been told when we were little, you'll never amount to anything, or someone told us in school, you'll never achieve anything, or someone told us, you shouldn't really, you should just kind of be comfortable where you're at and, and don't hope for anything. Nobody in our family's done anything great. Listen, that is something the devil uses on everybody. That's why you see movies where someone faced that wall and broke through that wall, and they make movies about it because many people face that wall and step back and say, well, I guess that's the line that I can't cross. 
I guess that's the point, a place of my life, that by, the barrier and boundary that I'm not welcome beyond. I guess, the, I guess I can't go any farther than where I'm at. But I'm telling you, you might not be able to go any farther within yourself. But when you connect to God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And all things are available to you. The Bible says the promises of God to you are yea and amen, which means approved and so be it. And if the devil screams, you can, that should be validation that you can. Because yeah. Jesus said that the, that the devil is the father of all lies. There is no truth in him. Right. And then when he's screaming, you can't, you can't, you can't, smile and say, thank you for the verification, validation, yeah. devil, because that means I can't. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be telling me that. And the same devil, once you cross over the tells you you can't, will say you can't stay. Just like he did Israel. Let's go back. Let's go back. Now there's a better ahead of me even than this. I mean, it might look like a Red Sea, but if God has to, he will split the Red Sea just for you. He will split the opposition just for you. He will split. Listen, I, I just feel this in my spirit. Are you listening to me? Do not get offended to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Do not look to politicians to open the pathway for you. They like to be. And this is not Democrat, Republican, or whatever, any party. Human nature, human nature, John 1, Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them, in humanity, within humanity. People want to be all powerful and overlord over everything. That is a human nature regardless of ideology. You have to be cautious. And they want you to think that they are the answer to all of your problems. I just heard a speech recently where the politician, and I won't go to who, who because who is not the point, but literally said that average people can't manage their own affairs, that they need to submit their rights to, the, the, to an all-powerful, wasn't talking about God. They want to be the ones where you think, oh, if I only had this person in office, if I only had that person, then they'll take care of me and open up. Listen, listen, listen. You can't put your trust in men like that. You have to look at God and say, God, I don't care who's in office. I don't care if I voted for him or didn't vote for him, like him, hate him, irre irrelevant, regardless of that. God, you are still on the throne, and if you say go, I will go. If you say I can succeed, I can succeed. If you say start, I will start. Do you see that? We have to be willing to look beyond humanity and look to God and say, Lord, it's all about you. And many times we'll look, well, if someone will help me, wasn't that the problem of the man who was at the pool of Bethesda and Jesus shows up just for that man? Jesus, the Son of God. The word that became flesh, John 1, verse 14. Jesus walks up on the scene and says, do you want to be made whole? And he said, yeah, but I don't have anybody to help me to the water when the angel stirs it. See, they believe that ever so often an angel would come by and stir the water, and if the water moved, then the first one in got healed. Did that happen? I don't know. Could be a strong breeze. I don't know. I don't know. But in his mind, that was his barrier. His mind, that was the impossibility. And here's Jesus standing in front of him. Do you want to be made whole? And instead of saying yes, he started saying why he couldn't. When you face the opportunity to cross a bridge to maybe a better level, a better promotion, a better job, a better relationship, whatever it might be, and the devil puts tension. He puts in your mind the reasons why you can't. And instead of focusing on Jesus and the reason why you can what did Jesus do? He took his eyes off of the people. Well, I would, Lord, I would like to be blessed, but I need somebody to give me more money. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's how they do it. Lord, I would love to feel better. I just need the doctor to give me the right combination, the right medicine. Wait, 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 wait. That's not wrong, but that's the way they do it. 
Lord, I, I, I would love to, to be happy if only those around me would be a little kinder and more encouraging. And more, wait, 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 wait. That's how they do it. But when Jesus is talking to you, what does he do? He's, he turned his attention away from the way they do it, the way it's been done, the way it's always been done. Have you ever been held back by, this is the way we've always done it. And he turned his, fo his focus and attention toward Jesus. And he said, look to me, look to me, look to me. Come, get your focus. Doesn't the Bible say, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Doesn't Hebrews 6, 12 tell us that we inherit the promises of God through faith and patience? We got to get our eyes off the way it's always been done, the way they tell us it's going to be done, or what keeps us from doing it, and say, all right, Lord, what are you saying? And he said, look to me. Look to me. And he began to speak and give him direction. And as the guy believed and obeyed, there was a miracle that happened to him. Sometimes our miracle is moments away from us being willing to believe and obey what God's saying to us. Amen. Because we're so used to doing it the way we've always done it. Didn't Einstein say insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results? Sometimes as our heart, Lord, you just show me what to do. Because we hinder our own limitation. We tell ourselves we got reason, we got logic, we got experience, we got practice on why it doesn't work. But if God said it to you, yeah. Hmm. The one who watches over his word to perform it. The word that goes forth and will not return void, Isaiah 55, 11. If God said it to you. And so what we have to do is begin to look and say, wait a minute, I need to get myself. This is just not you, this is for me, this is for all of us. I need to get myself into the place where I understand the identity of who I am so that I can have what God wants me to have, I can do what God wants me to do, I can be what God wants me to be, I can help what God, who God wants me to help, that I, I become an instrument in the hand of God, and I'm not limited when the enemy says, you don't deserve it, you can't afford it, you don't, you'll never get there, you'll never be successful there. Say, wait a minute, that's not your, I'm not going to look to me. I'm going to look to him. See, I'm going to look to Jesus. All right, let's get to our first verse. Hallelujah. And some of you are thinking, oh, that's, we haven't got to the first verse? Oh, Jesus, help me. I, see, that's how I can get you to pray real quick, right there. Your Lord, help us. No, we're not going to be alone. Say, I am good. Say, I am good. Kind of feels weird. Let me add to this. Let's bring a context. One day they approached Jesus and said, good, good master, good teacher, how do we inherit eternal life? And Jesus stopped them right in the tracks, which is so interesting. I mean, you would think that if, if someone came to you and said, how do I get saved? Even if they misaddressed your identity, you would still say, we'll deal with that later. Let's deal with the more important thing. Here's how to get saved. But Jesus for some reason in that moment, which I think we can draw from, identified the most important thing in the moment was the identity of who is good. And he stopped him and said, wait a minute, there is none good but one. And that's God. That's Heavenly Father. And so there is none good but one. And all of a sudden now we have an identification of who is good. God is good. And Jesus said there is none good but one. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Greg. You just told me I'm good. I only gave you part truth. That's why you got to listen all the way through. Because a part truth can mess you up. Did you hear me? A part truth can mess you up. Because if you walk out of here and say, oh, if I excel in an area, boy, I am so good. That's dangerous. Because you're looking to your own successes to validate your goodness. The equal flip side, we got to stay in the center of the road. The equal flip side is to say, I look at my failures, and I'm not so good. Yeah. That's also equally dangerous. Why? Because either side, our focus is on us. But when we get down to the center of it, say, wait a minute, there's only one good, and that's God. So now I can say it this way, you are good in God. Say with me, I am, I am good. Come on, shout, I am good, I am good. In, God. in God. Only God's good. And so for you to be good, you need to do it in God. 
Because the reality is not based on, and keep everything in balance. This is, there, I know there's a teaching around there saying that you're good and got it, so anything you do is okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's okay to sin. The Bible is very specific. I don't know how you read the Bible and see in the New Testament that it's okay to sin. It doesn't. Paul's very specific in Romans 6. Do we use our freedom so that we go back and do sin? And he said, God forbid. Yeah. I don't know how you read that. But I read when he says, God forbid, that means it's not a good idea. Right? right? Your freedom from sin is not freedom to sin. There's a whole different ballgame. But my freedom from sin to stay free, stay free from sin is all based on Jesus. He is your strength. He is your ability. It's a relationship. He is your life. He's the vine. You're the branch. You can do all things through Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You are more than a conqueror. Now thanks be to God which always causes you to triumph through Christ Jesus. You are good in God. Here's my key verse. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he who has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness, the righteousness, the righteousness of God in him. Stay with me. Righteousness means right standing, right relationship. It means, guess what? You're good. Can you imagine going to buy a car or something real expensive and that you negotiate the price, you get to the price, and they say, okay, it's how do you want to pay for this? You say, oh, I, I brought all, everything I need to pay for, I brought it in a, my paper sack. They're like, wow, that's crazy. They don't need credit. I have a friend of mine who used to sell cars, and he talked about how this one gentleman came on the lot, and, you know, when you walk on the lot, sometimes they'll kind of evaluate if they think you're going to be a buyer or you're going to waste time. And so this particular day, it was a person that no one thought had any money, to, two nickels were rubbed together, and so they're all arguing, I'm not going to go out and help them, I'm not going to go out and help them. And no one wanted to go out in, in the weather to help the person look at, for a vehicle. So finally, the, he, him being a Christian felt kind of bad. He said, all right, I'll, I'll just do it to be kind. So he went out there and talked to the guy and said, can I help you? And he walked through the process, oh yeah, I really like this truck. And he goes, great. He goes, uh, talked about it. He goes, no, I know everything about it. I've researched it. I'm ready. I want to buy this truck. And he went, good, okay. Well, how do you want to finance it? You want to lease it? You want to finance it? He goes, oh, no, I brought cash. And he pulled out a big wad of <laughs> cash. You never know. Right. And, I, and I, I feel that in my spirit to speak over your life. People will never know what God's getting ready to do through your life. They might second guess you, they might diminish you, they might devalue you, but you wait up, wait till you get to the place and watch what God does in your life. Well, can you imagine, can you imagine going up to somebody and say, oh yeah, I, I brought, you set this big bag down and they're thinking it's cash and they look inside and it, it's nothing but, excuse the phrasing, but I get it from the Bible, it, it was nothing but dog poop. And they would think, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't buy that car with this. Oh, you say, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. I'll be back. Where are you going? To get another bag. Come back with a second bag. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, babe. You don't understand. You can't buy that car with this. We don't accept this bag of... You said it. Be careful which one you say. You, know, you, know, you can't buy that car with this. You can bring two bags. You can bring three bags. You can bring 20 bags. But it doesn't matter because those bags will never buy. They're not the currency for this car. You say, Pastor, what's that got to do with it? Paul says, all my personal achievements I consider is done. Folks, when we're trying to receive from heaven, a lot of people will try to validate their ability to receive based on how good they are. And it's like coming to God and saying, I want to buy a healing. Here you go. Well, I'm sorry. We don't accept that kind of stuff. Oh, I'll go do a little more good works so that I can earn my righteousness, so I can earn my healing, so I can earn 
my blessing. I'm not saying that there's not work, because James says faith without works is dead. It's an outflow of the faith, not an objective to get the faith. And so we get faith by the word of God, Romans 10 tells us. And so what do we tend to do? We have a human tendency of trying to earn what God has provided. You can't earn what God's provided because all of your works in you don't work to buy that. It's like taking a bag of poop to buy a car. Don't work that way. We don't accept that. And heaven looks and says, I want you to have the healing. I want you to have the blessing. But you can't get it with those bags. The stopping point for Israel is that they still try to, Hebrews tells us that they are still trying to earn their righteousness by works, which means they're bringing the wrong currency to the counter. My wife has a thing, she's uh, helped with Logan and I. that if she's going to go pick up food and there's no drive through she'll pull up to the front and Logan jumps out. With the, with the debit card, walks into the store, orders the food, pays for it. Logan's name's not on that card. Logan does not have her own credit card or debit card. <laughs> and we all say amen to that. <laughs> and quite honestly, my wife's name's probably not on that card. <laughs> my name's on that card. Logan, Kim pulls up, Logan gets out, Logan makes the order, and when they say, how are you going to pay for it, she slides her daddy's card. Come on, somebody. You're going to get this in a minute. You're going to get this in a minute. Because when you're praying for healing, blessing, any of the promises of God, the devil's saying, how do you deserve that? He's saying, how are you paying for it? He don't look, and most people say, oh, I've been a Sunday school teacher for 32 years, and I help my neighbor, and I bake some pies, and I wash my neighbor's car from time to time. Uh-uh, that currency doesn't work there. You got to do, we receive it by faith. You're in a position of faith. You're connected as an heir of God, joint heir of Christ. Are you with me? You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And when the devil says, how are you going to pay for it? So, oh, don't worry. It's not about me. Here's my daddy's card. Yeah. Hallelujah. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. His name's on it. He's the provider of it. He's the source of it. But you are the child of God. You know how to access it. Hallelujah. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Put it on this. Take it from here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 because he is good, he is good. Goodness is the currency, faith is the avenue to receive it. I think that's why the psalmist kept saying through the Old Testament, give thanks unto the Lord, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! When you're going for a job, just hope I can get this job. Don't be passive with it. Lord, you show me. You open the doors, no man close, close doors, no man can open. And when the devil starts to mess with you, he says, Thank you, Father, you are good. I'm connected into your goodness. I'm connected into your goodness. My finances are connected into your goodness. I obey in giving because I'm connected in your goodness. I obey in helping other people because I'm connected into your goodness. I obey in serving because I'm connected into your goodness. I connect to you in my living because I'm connected. I thank you, Father. You are good. You are, and your mercy, your mercy, your mercy. Say what? Put it on this card. Hallelujah. And if they happen to say, do you have any ID with it? Oh, I sure do have some identification. Let me give you a scripture to tell the devil. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the vine, I'm the branch. I'm part of the body of Christ. And if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. You're having a good day today. Hallelujah. 
It's not about you. It's not about you. Stop letting the devil rob you, John Tintin. Stop letting the devil hinder you from what God has for you and what he has for you. Just like the father told his prodigal son and the brother, he said, don't you realize all that I have belongs to you? The Bible says if he did not withhold his son, what would he say no to you? The promises of God are yes and approved for you in Jesus' name. Stop letting the devil rob from you. He is good. Your father's good. He's better than you can imagine. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has entered the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You serve a good God. You serve a good God. You serve a good God. He's not the author of confusion. He's not the cause of the curse. Now you serve a good God. Hallelujah! Thank you, Father. You are good. You are good. You are good. And even if today you stand within a house that's being attacked by the storms of life, take a step back and say, I thank you, Jesus. You said, if I build my life on your word, the storms have to go. They cannot stay. This too will pass, and I will survive. I will succeed. I will be better. He's a good God. He's a good God. But pastor, you don't understand. I used to serve the Lord. I don't serve him anymore. I messed up yesterday. I messed up last night. I messed up this morning. I'm telling you, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you sin, he is faithful. Just confess it. And he is faithful to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's bringing you back. He's bringing you back into the place of his goodness. In the place of his goodness. In the place of his goodness. You're not good because you helped somebody. You're good because of Jesus. You're not good because you're, you are pet compassionate. You're good because of God. And out of that goodness flows compassion, flows mercy, flows generosity, flows. And when you mess up a step out of it, repent and get back in it because it's the goodness of God. It leads, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that even leads people to repentance. Hallelujah. Say, He's good. Shout, He's good. Say, Thank you, Father, that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before, you know what, I want to share a testimony before we go farther. I had a gentleman stop me in the, in, when I was greeting people in the front before service. He said, oh, Pastor, i got to share a story. I said, what is it? He said, I went to the doctor. And he said, this is what, he showed me on his phone, a list of four or five things. Cholesterol, blood pressure, all these things bad. He said, I came to church just a few months ago. And he said, I sat near the front, and he said, I just prayed, Jesus, I give you my life. And he said, I just came back from the doctor a couple, mo- couple months later. I went back and they ran the test and they said, I don't know what to tell you. Everything's fine. God's the healer. He's not the cause of sickness. He's the healer. By Jesus stripes you were healed. That's how good your God is. That's how good. Say he's good. He's 